will be passing baskets and buckets. As you know by now, those are for the building fund. So place uh, any money that you'd like to go to the building fund in those baskets or buckets as they are being passed by the children. Some announcements uh, of upcoming activities. Uh, next week, next Sunday, we'll be having baptism in the morning service. And next Sunday night, we are hosting the association meeting by the Omaha Association that starts at 6 o'clock. Brother Steve Parr will be preaching next Sunday night. I encourage you to come near Brother Steve. He has been involved in Georgia Baptist life for a long time, served in uh, the Gula and Hebrew Baptist Church written several books on Sunday school as well as about youth, why they stay, why they stray, uh, and you will be blessed to hear Brother Steve. That's next Sunday night. Also, uh, the dental unit at the weekend, a part of our love lane, is taking place October the 11th through the 13th. If you did, would like to help with that, contact the church office. You can find out more information concerning it. And also, we're still asking for clothes donations. We are going to have a clothes giveaway on that Saturday. So if you have any gently used clothing that you would like to share, then uh, please uh, bring those items. We'll have those sorted and ready uh, to give out on the 13th. Also, we had 277 in Sunday school this morning. Just a reminder, there is a place for you in Sunday school, I hope you'll come and share in those times where uh, care is given and you study the Word of God. And also remember our family night supper inserts. We need those turned in to the church office by noon on Tuesday. You can drop these in the basket. You can uh, call the church office or you can go online and sign up for that. Give your attention to the other folks that are sharing announcements.
All the parents should have letters in the mail by now explaining what we're doing this year. I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be an amazing trip, and I'm hoping that all of your students are going to be willing to come as well, because I think they'll get a lot out of it. Also, as you have been probably pestered by our students so far, we are selling pancake tickets. So that's going to continue going on until the Sunday before, which will be October 14th. That'll be the last day that we sell the tickets, and then the dinner will be October 16th from 5.30 to 7.30. And then also, Caleb would like for me to mention about the Youth Girls Sleepover. We've been advertising that for the youth. And um, it's October 19th. It's going to be at the Honey Creek Retreat Center in Brunswick. It's going to be $10 per, per student for girls. And then it's going to be due October 10th. And as you can see, the stage looks a little bit different this morning than it normally does. What we had this morning is we're, we're taking the opportunity to celebrate our students. So we're having a Youth Sunday. And I just want to say right now that I'm very impressed with how much our students have grown and how dedicated they've become to this ministry over the last year and a half that I've been here. And it's just awesome how God is moving in our student group. And I just want to be able to take the opportunity to show them all the Lord. So as they're singing, most of the songs that they're going to sing you should be familiar with because they did play them on the radio. So just join in and just worship along with us.
Lord, I thank you for this morning as we come together, as we get together and just worship you. Lord, I thank you for these students and their willingness to, to just be excited about how we can showcase who we are as Calvary students. Lord, I just pray that through the service you would be glorified. Lord, be with everyone here, those that are guests. I pray that you would bless them as well, Lord, and that you would just bring us to the throne of grace this morning. I praise you for who you are, Lord. For those in the community, I ask that you would help them if they need it. Lord, that you would use our church as a beacon of light for those that are hurting. And Lord, that we would always put you first in everything that we do. I praise you for who you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So again, I want to welcome all of you here this morning. If you're a guest, if you look in your bulletin, there's a section there that you can write out information and tear it off so that we can have the opportunity to minister to you and your family. Just drop that in the offering plate whenever that comes around. But I want to take a second just to talk about our youth group and, and kind of what I've seen since I've been here. Um, and this is not anything that I've done, but just the way that God has moved. I've noticed the students have been more diligent to, to study, been more diligent to learn, and take leadership roles in the youth and in other areas of their lives. I've seen an excitement come about them that, that wasn't there when I got here. And it's just amazing seeing students get excited about learning about Jesus. And it's amazing seeing students be excited about going out and serving in the community. And that's a culture that I want to, to just bring to light because our students are so hungry to serve. They're hungry to love on people. They're hungry to, to do all of these great things. And we have opportunities to give them avenues to do so. And like I said, I want them to be the center of attention this morning because I'm just so excited about what God's doing in our ministry. Just since camp, we've had between six and seven students come to know Christ. Um, we've had students that are bold in their faith or where they're sharing the gospel and standing up for what they believe in in their schools, regardless of what the repercussions may be. I mean, these are men and women. They may be teenagers, but they can make men and women decisions. And it's just awesome how they're allowing God to use them. And I'm proud of them. I'm excited how God's working, and I can't wait to see what God's going to do in the future with these students. But at this time, if you'll stand, we'll go around, we'll welcome each other, and we'll just continue our service.
sorrow. Please help them to know that you're near. I pray that you would heal people today, that you would change people's lives. Help us to know that you're near. Just now pray.
that you did everything for us because we did nothing. All we can do is wonder, Lord, that you sought us out and found us. So I pray to you, Lord, by Jesus and our Good morning again. I'm very excited for the opportunity to get to speak to you this morning. And as you can see, I have a lot to be excited about with our students. And it's just, like I said earlier, it's amazing how God is working in their lives. And every morning I wake up, you know, we get those jobs sometimes where we feel like we don't want to have to go to work. You know, sometimes we want to take a day off. But I can tell you honestly that I wake up every morning and I'm excited to come here knowing that God is going to do something special. And I'm just, I'm excited to get to speak to you this morning about what it means to be an authentic Christian. Whenever I got here back last March, I challenged our students to live authentically. I challenged our students to be honest with myself, to be honest with their small group leaders, with their parents about what was really going on in their lives, because we can get in the habit of thinking that there's no one else that could understand us. And so I challenged them to be authentic, and I've seen growth through that, because we have students that are, that are coming up on Wednesday nights, they're coming to the altar, and they're praying, and and just like in here on Sunday mornings, whenever one student goes up, there's a flock of other students that go around them, and they lay their hands on them, and they pray for them. That just warms my soul. It, it's amazing to see how much God works in our student ministry because of what we do here on Sunday mornings. They take after what we do when someone comes down and prays, and they gather around them. They see that that's an appropriate action because they see us as adults doing it. And so today, this message is to challenge you as parents, as leaders in the church, as leaders in the community, to live authentic lives so that our students can have someone to look up to. And so one thing that I love about seeing people learn is when that thing finally clicks. With Jonah, and I found out that I'm the same way, whenever he learns something, it's like he hyperventilates a little bit. He gets excited, he gets this kind of goofy laugh. And it just, it makes me laugh too because I'm the same way. You know, I learn something new and I get excited about it and I just kind of have this goofy laugh. And it's amazing how our kids can pick up on those habits even when we don't realize it. And so seeing that click with him, it always makes me happy because I know that he's learning. And I know that what we're doing is actually teaching him something. Our first step in being an authentic Christian is learning authenticity. Authenticity is not just something that we discover one day or that we know inherently. It's something that we have to learn because we see it exemplified through other people. And so if we see other people living authentically, that shows us how we can live authentically. And the first thing that we need to learn is to learn who Christ is. And I don't mean just having information about Christ. I think it would be safe to say that everyone in here knows something about Jesus. We know something that the Bible teaches about Jesus. But what we learn from James 2.19 is that even the demons know and they tremble. And so just this information about Christ is not enough. There's more to him than just head knowledge. There's more than just learning historical facts about Jesus. There are a lot of biblical scholars, and you may not believe this or not, but there's a lot of biblical scholars who are not Christians. They know the Bible inside and out, and yet they don't know Christ. They know Scripture. They know how it intermingles among other texts within the Bible itself, and yet they still don't believe because all they have is information. Information in itself is not going to convince you to believe. That's why it comes through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's why these scholars know the Bible, and they could argue the Bible inside and out, and yet they still don't believe it. That would be like doing a research paper. You know, we find someone that we don't want to do a research paper on, let's say George Washington. There are books and books and books written about George Washington. There's historical evidence that there is about George Washington. And we could read every book that was ever written, but that doesn't mean that we would know George Washington. We would know about him. We would know some of the things that he did. We would know some of his military victories. We would know when he was president, but we wouldn't know him personally. It's the same way with Jake Fromm. You could learn every statistical thing there is about Jake Fromm, but you would never know what his favorite ice cream is or what makes him tick, what he thinks. And it's the same way with Christ. If all we do is read the Bible just from an informational standpoint, if all we do is learn facts and we miss who Christ is completely, then that's not authentic Christianity. We have to know Christ and not just know about him. And so when we begin to know Christ, that's when that light bulb moment comes on, when the Holy Spirit, you know, removes our scales of blindness like he did with Paul, and we begin to, to fully experience who Christ is. There's a difference there than just knowing facts and actually knowing Christ. Knowing Christ causes us to change our mentality. 
Knowing Christ causes us to change who we are, causes us to make decisions that we may not have made before, like stepping out on faith. You know, when we stand back and we think about a situation and we look at it and we're like, you know, just from our fleshly perspective, that's not something that I'm comfortable doing. But whenever the Holy Spirit comes in and reveals to it that God's taking care of us, we're much more courageous to step out in faith and to do those things that God's called us to do. Like changing jobs or moving across the country or going into the mission field. When the Holy Spirit is there and we know Christ personally, then it makes it a whole lot easier to make those decisions because we have the understanding that Christ is going to provide for us. And so how do we learn about Christ in more than just an informational way? Well, first of all, what we need to understand is that God already knows us. And in 1 Samuel 16, 7, let's see what it says. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I rejected him. For God sees not as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So what's going on here in 1 Samuel is that the Israelites have been begging for a king. And they had Saul, but Saul had done some terrible things, and so God has rejected Saul, and God's already moved on to who his, his true king is going to be. And so Samuel is called to go to the house of Jesse to find the king. And so Samuel goes, and he has this, the same way that we would experience, we're looking for a king, we're looking for someone tall, someone muscular, someone that looks like they could take care of business. But he goes down the entire line of Jesse's sons, and God says, not him, not him, not him. And Samuel asks, is there anyone else left? And he says, yeah, David's over tending to the sheep. Now, David is not this miraculous being. It says that he's a runt, basically. That he's the smallest of the children. Yet God says, that's who I want to be king because I know his heart. I know what he is going to do because I've created him. We forget sometimes that God knitted us together in our mother's womb. That God has a desire for us to exist, and that's why we're here in the first place. That if you didn't have a purpose, then God wouldn't have created you. Each one of us is called to do something in the kingdom of God if we are his children. And knowing Christ authentically is how we get to understand what God is calling us to do. We can get in a habit sometimes of wearing a mask. You know, we don't want to let people in. We get uncomfortable sharing with people who we actually are. And so we hear terms like the word hypocrite. And what's interesting, if you guys didn't know this, hypocrite comes from theater. It actually means an actor when they put on a mask and they begin to play a part. And so a lot of times we get so uncomfortable being honest with people, with being authentic, that we put on this mask to make people think that we're, we're holier than we are, that we're farther along in our walk with Christ than we are. But honestly, we all struggle. We all have days where it's harder to get up than others, to where something terrible happens and we, we take our eyes off God because we're focusing on the situation. But this external mask, this this protection that we put on ourselves is not going to allow us to draw close to God. It's not going to allow us to be who we need to be for our students and for the people around us. Because sometimes our students need to see that we're hurting too. They need to see that we struggle too. Because what happens is if we get to the point to where we're uncomfortable talking about how we struggle sometimes, they're going to think that we're supposed to be perfect. And then when they get to a point to where they struggle in their faith, they're going to abandon it because they feel like they're doing it wrong. And so sometimes we have to be honest with them and tell them, you know, I'm struggling with this. Get them to pray with you. Open that avenue up that they're able to be an accountability partner for you as much as you are for them. Because as they grow older, when they see that we are demonstrating our faith in all avenues of life, then they're going to be more comfortable traveling that same road. Instead of if we just try to make it seem like we're always going to be perfect. Because I can tell you myself, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes just like everybody else. And I tell our kids that. I don't give them all the gory details, but I do tell them, you know, Daddy messed up today. I apologize to them whenever I raise my voice for no reason. Whenever I'm ill and I get aggravated and they're not doing anything and I lash out to them, I immediately apologize to them because I'm trying to set an example as their father as to what a man of God is supposed to be. Kayla's trying to set an example as a mother of what a woman of God is supposed to be. And we have a desire for our kids to, to be that person to be that man or that woman of God, and to be able to live their lives in their faith knowing that not every day is going to be perfect. And we do that by communicating that with them. But we hear this word hypocrite a lot. If we're not authentic Christians, then we're only playing a part. We're not really living this life. We might know who Jesus is, but we're wearing a mask and we're not truly experiencing the Holy Spirit. When God overlooked David's brothers and chose him, he shows us something important. This external mask that we wear, it's not what makes us authentic. 
Whenever a football player puts on a helmet, he's a football player, but when he takes it off, he's no longer a football player. He's just a normal person, just like you and I. But David was described as a runt, but he, chose, he was chosen to be king because God saw his heart. When God looks at our hearts, what does he see? God knows you better than anyone else ever will. Whether you are just born or you've been married for 50 years, God knows your heart better than your spouse does, better than your mother or your father does. Does he merely see a person playing the role of Christian, or does he see an authentic believer? Being authentic means repenting of sin, changing our minds to no longer just wear a mask, but to throw it away and expose who we really are. There's a level of trust there with God that we're going to say that I'm taking this mask off and I'm going to reveal the ugliness beneath it. I'm going to reveal the dirtiness that's there because God already knows about it. He's just asking us to take that step of faith to, to admit that we're not perfect. And then through that, through that faith in Christ, we can show other people how God is working in our lives and ultimately he gets the glory for that. There's a lot of stuff that we as adults could tell our students that we struggled with and because how God brought us through that, we get to give God the glory. We just have to be willing to admit that we're not perfect. But when we repent, it changes our minds. And it makes us into something new. We reveal our hearts to God, who already knows them anyway. But we also reveal our heart to ourselves. Sometimes one of the greatest things we can do is admit to ourselves that we're not perfect. That admit to ourselves that we're struggling. Admit to ourselves that we cannot do this on our own. And there's a lot of healing in that. I mean, I've been talking to our students for the last four weeks about depression and how we try to hide those feelings, but they say one of the best things you can do is admit there's a problem, first and foremost. And then it brings it out into the open, and then people can begin to help you, begin to help you become who God has created you to be. And so when we reveal our hearts, we admit that we need salvation, that we can't do it ourselves. And then we trust that Christ can and will save us and will give us our identity. Our identity is no longer what we can do, but it's what Christ has done for us. And we begin learning who Christ is, not just from an informational lens, but now through the lens of the Holy Spirit. We begin to experience the heart of Jesus instead of just information that we've collected. That'd be like instead of just knowing all of Jake's from stats, actually getting to meet him and befriend him and having conversations with him and seeing who he is past who he is on the football field. We need to see who Christ is past what it says just in Scripture. We need to be able to take these words and apply them to our hearts and see how Christ worked in those situations and become more like him. And there are other ways that we can be an authentic Christian. First and foremost, we need to be a believer. Second of all, we need to study the Word. We need to make it a priority in our families to read Scripture together and to talk about it. I'd be willing to admit that's something that our family struggles with as well. You know, we get very busy. We've got sports, we've got other things that are going on, whether it's work or you know, youth band or all these different things, and for some reason, it seems like that's the first thing to go. But that is the most significant thing that you can do with your family is to read scripture with them, to show them what Christ is doing, to show them how God has worked through all of these situations, to give them proof that even though things may get difficult, God is still going to be there, that God is still going to work for them. We may think we're too busy now or that our students aren't going to care as much, but like I said, it's one of the most significant things we can do. When they see us as adults reading our Bibles, it shows them that this book is more important than just opening up on Sunday mornings and Sunday night. It shows them that this book, this Bible, is more important than just something to collect dust on a shelf. Because we have to set the example as parents, as leaders. We need to show them what it means to be a Christian. We need to show them that we love this Bible, that we love what God has said to us. And what we need to understand is that it's a love letter crafted by the creator of the universe to lead those who were created in his image to restore the relationship that was broken in the only way possible through a relationship with the one who died for our sins. This Bible is not just a dead book, or is not a dead book. This Bible is a living book. With the same breath that God created us, God created this word. It is sharper than a double-edged sword. It will cause us to be aware of who we are in God's eyes, whether that's lost and needs salvation or whether that's redeemed in him and we get to rejoice in what God has said to us. But either way, this Bible is not something that we should neglect. We need to make it a, a cemented thing in our daily routine that we read our Bibles, not only by ourselves, but with our kids. Whether that's right after we eat dinner, right before we go to bed, 
but I'm telling you, they're listening a lot more than we realize. If you think that they're not, look at any kind of habit that you have that they've picked up. They pay attention to what you do. What I've learned over the years is that children listen a lot more than they think. They pick up our bad habits, also our good. And I've got some habits that I do that Jonah kind of picks up on. Sometimes I get frustrated and I just kind of throw my hands up in the air, and I've seen him do that a couple times. Or I'll say little funny words just to kind of make somebody laugh, and he's gotten to where he starts doing that as well. Because he's picking up on those habits. I'm setting an example for him as a father that he is following. Christ set an example for us to be authentic Christians, and we need to follow that example. And by doing so, we set the example for everyone around us, including our kids. Reggie Joyner wrote a book called Think Orange. In this, he probed the thought that students were more influenced by friends, television, and video games. We hear that kind of thrown around a lot. The kids don't listen to their parents. They're more influenced by their friends. They're more influenced by violent video games or television shows or music or all of these different things. And so Reggie Joyner actually set out to prove whether or not this was true. But what he found out is kind of shocking. The first thing he found out was that for a youth pastor, there's about 40 to 50 hours a year that students spend with their youth pastor. And that's not counting camp or how we do winter retreat, but just on a typical Wednesday night service throughout the year, they spend about 40 hours a year with their youth pastor. That's how much influence I have on their lives, is 40 hours. With vacation, with sports, with them being sick, all these different things, I get about 40 hours a year with your students. He also found out that they spend about 400 hours a year playing video games or doing homework. And it may actually be more than that now. I know students are put through much more rigorous academic training than they were when I was in school. And so roughly 400 hours, that's 10 times more hours they're going to spend playing Fortnite than they are with me. And then what he also found out is that 3,000 hours are spent with parents. So if you don't think that you have an influence on your child, let this be a reminder. They spend more time with you than they do with anyone else. So they're going to look at your lives, they're going to pick up on your habits, whether they're good or bad, and they're going to become you at some point. I think we've all said, you know, I'm never going to become like my mother or become like my father. And yet we know that after we have kids, that we begin to say the same things that our parents said. One of the ones my mom used to say was, uh, were you raised in a barn every time that we leave the door open? And I've caught myself saying that to Jonah and Emily when they go in the backyard. Were you raised in a barn? And so we pick up these mannerisms, whether we realize it or not, of our parents or of those people that were influences on us that raised us, and our kids are going to do the same thing with us. And so we need to make sure that we're studying the word. The next thing is we need to make sure that we're faithful to church. We live in a very busy age. We fill our schedule as much as possible, and sometimes, sadly, church gets pushed out for something else. We've gotten to the point to where we treat church as a recreational activity instead of something that is necessary for our walk with Christ. There was a study done that was around the year 2000 that should open your eyes. I know it was 18 years ago, but this information is still very relevant. And this is what they discovered. It said, in short, if a father does not go to church, no matter how faithful his wife's devotions, only one child in 50 will become a regular worshiper. Fathers, it is important that we set the example, that we set the standard in our families. God called us to be the spiritual leaders in the household. If we are not setting that spiritual standard for our children, our wives cannot do it for us. God called us to do that, not the mothers. Sometimes when the, mother, when the father's not present, the mother has to step up and do so, but we are naturally called by God to lead the example. We are called by, called by God to lead our children in Bible study, to lead them in prayer, to lead them in service, to show them what it means to be an authentic Christian. And sadly, a lot of us have failed. That's why we see this study that was done. If all these fathers would have been doing what they've been called to do, we would not see a one child in 50 ratio. I don't know if you know this or not, but there's about an 80% chance that once a student graduates, they drop out of church. That's nationwide, 80% chance that they drop out of church. No matter how much the student pastor spends time with them, no matter how much the mother brings in the church, if that father is not devoted to raising their child spiritually, then that kid has an 80% chance to drop out of church. What he continues on saying is that if a father does go regularly, regardless of the practice of the mother, between two-thirds and three-quarters of their children will become churchgoers. So this number changes from one in 50 to one in three. If a father goes to church consistently, if a father shows them that church is important, then that number changes from one in 50 to one in three that remain in church. 
or two and three, excuse me, that remain in church. That is a massive shift that shows fathers, that shows us how important it is that we have our families in church. Even on days that we'd rather be hunting or fishing, even on days where the Atlanta Falcons might be playing, we still need to be in church because that sets the example for our families. I've had several parents come to me when it, through my 10 years of working in youth ministry, and they say, I just don't know what happened. Why is my kid not involved in church anymore? And I have to ask them a question, why are you not involved in church? We've got so many parents I've seen, and I'm not saying that that's happening here, but I've had so many parents over the last 10 years that they think that the church is like a fast food restaurant. We drop our kids off, they get spiritually fed for a little bit, and then they're supposed to be these perfect Christians. And then we go home, we watch TV, and we do nothing to develop that spiritual, gift, or that spiritual life that our students have. They have to see us living this life. We can't just tell them to go and do something and then not do it ourselves. That is what makes us a hypocrite. It's easier said than done, but we have to be willing to do it. If we truly are wanting our kids to be godly men and women, then we have to show them what it means to be a godly man and woman. It's as simple as that. And so the next thing is, we need to have them being discipled by mature Christians. There's been this, this lie that's been taught since I was in youth that the older, older people don't understand the younger people. That there's this fear that has existed between the older people and the younger people. That, you know, we may listen to different kinds of music, or we may, you know, do different kinds of activities, but at the end of the day, we're all called to be Christians. We all have something in common. And what's great about students is that most of them are very willing to learn. And so whenever we have older men and women in the church that are discipling our younger students, it gives them the opportunity to see how God has worked in every situation in their life. And so when they come to that same situation, they can say, well, this is how so-and-so handled that situation. This is how God worked in their life, and God can maybe work in my life the same way. I tell students a lot about the struggles that I had before I became a Christian because what God has done in my life, he is able to get the glory through all of those things. Even in the darkest times of my life, God was able to pull me out of that, and he gets the glory. It's not about saying how I conquered this mountain. It's about how God drug me through to make me to where I am now. And our students need to hear that from us as parents. They need to hear it from grandparents. They need to hear it from the ladies that sit on the edges of the, of the sanctuary. They need to hear it from the guys that are standing in the, in the for your shaking hands. All of us have a story to tell that we could tell these students about how God has worked in difficult situations and even in the great situations just to celebrate what God has done. Titus 2 reveals to us that there is a need for older women and older, older men and older women to teach the younger. I want to encourage you parents to find some older men and women in the church to allow them to spend time with your students to pray with them, to talk to them, to listen to them, and to tell them how God has worked in their lives. And that'll bridge this generational gap that everybody believes that we have. That'll help them to, to be more focused on staying in church because they see that God really is going to hold on, hold them until the end. That God really is going to help them to persevere. And so they're not willing to give up anymore because they see that their grandma has been faithful through the entire process. Or they see that their grandpa has been faithful or that the little old ladies that sit around the sanctuary are faithful to what God has done. And some of you have some great stories to tell. You could have been in the military, you could have lost a spouse, and you could tell them how God has worked in that, or lost a family member of these things, and just kind of give them the understanding that, that God still works, even 2,000 years later. So find opportunities to talk about how God has worked in your life, to refine you, to make you more like Christ. What I've told the students before in the past is that when we become a new Christian, we're kind of like clay when you first buy it from the store. It's very difficult to work with. It's hard. So when you take the wrapper off and you immediately start trying to twist and turn and to, and to mold it into something, it's very difficult. Sometimes I believe that when we first get saved, you know, it's very difficult for God to mold us to where we are. But the longer we go, the softer that clay becomes and God can make that into a beautiful work of art. That's what the students need to see in us. They need to see that beautiful work of art that God has developed within our lives. We should never be ashamed to talk about what God has done because it's going to make the clay that's in their hearts even softer when they see what God has done in yours. <coughs> and we get to talk about the storms that we may have gone through and we get to talk about the victories that God has brought us through and just celebrate with them how God can work in their lives no matter how difficult the circumstance. No matter how bleak the outcome may be, we can talk about how God worked in our lives in the same way and give them the courage and give them the encouragement to take that step of faith 
to do whatever it is that God's calling them to do. And these are all significant things for students to be encouraged to do, to be faithful to church, to read their Bibles, to have relationships with older men and women that can mentor them. I find myself as a parent telling our kids to do something, but I'm not willing to do it, or I don't assist them. I'll tell Jonah to clean my room, or to go clean his room before he gets out of bed, or before he gets out of his room, but I've got a pile of clothes on my floor. Or I'll tell him to pick up a piece of trash and I'll walk by a water bottle. It's easier for us to tell our students that they need to do something when we're not willing to do it, but God has commanded us that if we're going to tell them to do it, we need to do it ourselves. We've got to set that example. If we want their bedrooms clean, I need to have my bedroom clean. If I want him to be respectful to people, I need to be respectful to people. If I want him to be in love with Jesus, I need to be in love with Jesus. I've got to set the example in my household that we are going to follow Christ. And all of you are commanded to do the same. We as parents have to set the example for our students to follow Christ. So that brings me to my second point, and that's living authentically. First of all, this means trusting God in all situations. <clears throat> so we see in James 1, 2, and 3 that he gives us encouragement for when things get tough. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. It can be difficult to tough it out sometimes. If there's a family member that passes or an unexplained event that you can't really wrap your mind around, it can divert our attention from Christ. And like I said, this is what we've been discussing in the youth for several weeks now, is how to trust God in difficult situations, how God's going to work in difficult situations. And what we've come to find out is that if we are faithful to God, he's going to be faithful to us. And even in times where we're not faithful to God, he's still going to be faithful to us because he gives us grace that we don't deserve. And if we fall, he picks us up and he allows us to continue to trust in him even when we don't understand what's going on. Even in a difficult situation, he's still faithful. There's this change that happens within us when we begin to live authentically. As we become more drawn to living like Christ, we have a fundamental shift in our thinking and in our doing. We no longer are convinced that we have to do things to save ourselves. We're no longer convinced that we have to earn our salvation. We have this new identity in Christ that is designed by grace, which means that he will be with, there, or be with us, helping us through these tests, and guiding us along so that we can be successful in this authentic life that he's called us to. So we need to trust God in all situations. Next, we need to live boldly in our faith. We need to live boldly in our faith. One of the greatest things that we can do for our children is to live our faith out in front of them. We've all been taught a lie that we shouldn't talk about religion and politics. But we see the mess that we're in because we don't talk about religion or politics. It's these uncomfortable situations that, that shows us who we truly are. And so even with our parents or with our students, a lot of times we're uncomfortable talking about our faith because we've had it shoved down our throat for so long that we're not allowed to talk about it in public, that our faith is something that should be private. I don't know about y'all, but every time I read scripture, it never says that we need to keep our faith held within. It says that we need to go out and we need to share it, that we need to be bold that we need to talk about what Christ has done in our lives. And we see in 2 Timothy 1.7 that Paul writes that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That means that this faith that we have, this trust that we have in God is not something that we need to keep hidden because we worship the creator of the universe. We don't worship a man-made God. We don't worship a dead God. We worship the creator of the universe, and we need to rejoice in that. And we need to talk to people about that because those same people are searching and hurting for some kind of peace, for some kind of joy. And we've got to be willing to share that with them and tell them what God has done in our lives. And that includes our students. <clears throat> First of all, we need to live authentically when no one is watching. It's easy to live like Christ when there's an audience. It's easy to say the right things and to do the right things when there are people around you. But what do we do when nobody's watching? What do we do in our mind whenever we're having thoughts? Are we thinking about godly things or are we thinking about fleshly things? Each of us knows what tempts us. The question is, are we willing to fight against those temptations in our mind? Because like I said before, God knows our heart. He knows what drives us. He knows what motivates us. And what motivates us is not necessarily always the thing that's shown on the outside because we can all put on a mask. 
And we can all make people believe that, that we've got everything together. But God knows who we really are. And so the question is, is our mind in tune with who God is? Have we made our mind to repent from sin and to follow after Christ? So next, we need to be willing to break the status quo. We need to be willing to break the status quo. This means, like I said earlier, breaking the rule of never talking about politics and religion. When we withhold discussion from other groups, we become uneducated about it. That's why you have so many people arguing over politics now, because neither side really knows what's going on. They're just making stuff up to have their voice heard. What we need is people to sit down and have meaningful conversations, whether that's politics or religion. Our faith in Christ, we need to have meaningful conversations with people instead of just telling people they're going to die and go to hell. I mean, they already know that. If they've ever been in church, they know that. We need to talk to them about who God is. We need to show them the love of God. We, so, we talk so much about how much God loves people, and yet as soon as we see them on the other side of the road, we immediately judge them, and we condemn them. We've got to be willing to step across the street and to show them the love of God so that they don't have to face that condemnation. Because each one of us at some point in our lives were on the other side of the street, and someone came across the street and chose to speak to us. But Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16 says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but is on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Does this sound like the status quo? Does this sound like don't talk about politics or religion? Does this sound like my faith is my personal thing? And it's not for anybody else? I don't think so. Christ is commanding us here. He's saying that we are the light of the world. That we are surrounded by darkness. That we should shine no matter what the situation. So that other people can see what God has done in our lives. And bring glory to the Father. Everyone is going to watch you. Especially your students. They're watching you to see how you react. To see what you do. How you're going to handle a certain situation. And they're going to pick up that habit. So if you get frustrated and you get angry, they're going to begin to understand that that's a proper way to react to that situation. If you handle it coolly and you say, you know, God's going to have this under control, then they're going to understand that God is going to be able to provide. And so it can be taken either way. But our faith is something that we need to speak out about. We need to let our light shine before men. And how awesome would it be if every one of us in here let our light shine in Wayne County and we saw, we saw God do something amazing in this county. We saw a revival because we were faithful to be authentic, living Christians. When we have opportunities to speak to others about, about Jesus around us, we should do it. We have this good news, this gospel that others are searching for. They're looking for peace that we have, and because of the Holy Spirit within it, we can speak boldly about what Christ has done for us and what he can do for them. Living boldly requires a mind change from what to why. You know, we get in the habit of saying, well, what is this going to do for me? You know, what can I get from this? But in reality, Christ commands us to have this why mentality, as in why am I doing this? Because whenever you understand the why, that's when you can truly get to the heart of the situation. Why did Jesus come to earth? Why did Jesus die on a cross? Why did Jesus desire to save us in the first place? When we understand those things, why are we called to let our light shine? It changes our mentality from what can we get from this to what can we do to glorify God. And so we can change that mentality. We can change our heart to understand the why because it brings the purpose instead of just the profit. And it changes us from this mentality of I can't. How many of us say I can on a daily basis? I can't do that. I can't do this. You know, we have different forms of that. I don't have time. It's not in my wheelhouse. That's one I like to use. It's not in my wheelhouse. It's not my circus or my rodeo. I can't do it. It changes that mentality and that understanding from that to, I can, but I know it'll be hard, but it'll be doable. I know it'll be hard, but it'll be doable. When our students see that we have this mentality that even in the hardest situations, we're still going to fight, they're going to develop that mentality as well. And then we'll see them to succeed in life later on in their Christian walk because they've seen us do it too. They don't give up. They keep fighting, even when the situation gets difficult. 
when we begin to understand the why, the difficulty no longer becomes the forefront, it becomes an afterthought. It's not about how difficult it is, it's about how can I glorify God through the situation. I came across this quote a couple of years ago, and I think it's very relevant even still today. And this is what it says, a lack of church programs and entertainment is not why our youth are leaving the church. A lack of church programs and entertainment is not why our youth are leaving the church. I know from firsthand experience that this is true. Our youth have no relationship with Jesus, and that begins at home. Until we focus on fixing that, all of the entertainment in the world will not keep them. Until we focus on showing them Christ in our homes, it does not matter how many things we do at church, it doesn't matter how many programs, how many activities, it's not going to impact them as much as it is seeing their mom or their dad or their grandparents opening their Bible and reading it and encouraging them to participate and read it with them. Our students are craving to see us live that authentic life, to put God before everything else, even when we have a bad day, even when the situation looks bleak. If we truly believe that God can save us, we need to always remind that God can sustain us. If he can save us, he can sustain us. He can keep us. And we need to show our students that we're willing to live this life that we have been called to. So how do we do that? We do that through leading authentically. Leading authentically. One of the most popular verses of scripture that is quoted when it comes to families is Joshua 24, 15. I bet a lot of us have that, that scripture on our house, hanging somewhere on the walls in our house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua's confronting the Hebrew people about their practice of chasing false gods. He gives them the ultimatum that they must make a choice that day to either follow the Lord or follow the God of their ancestors. And he makes the bold statement in front of everyone and says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't care what you do. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So first of all, I want to challenge you to be the model. Be the model for your students. Have we made a genuine commitment to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? No matter the circumstances, no matter what happens, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Do we model this mentality in our homes? The thing that we forget as parents sometimes is that our kids see us who we really are, see us as who we really are. They see us in our best times, they see us in our worst times. They see how we handle situations and they begin to develop those same things. I think I see sometimes in teenagers, whenever they are argumentative with their parents, a lot of times it's because their parents tend to be argumentative. It's not always that case, but there is some, some give there that there's a corresponding action between how the parents respond to a situation and how the student's going to respond to a situation. And then we don't understand why they act that way. It's because they're following our example. Kayla and I have noticed that our kids are picking up our mannerisms or our habits, both the good and the bad. We can tell them to pick up a dish that they left on the table or pick up trash on the floor, but if we're not willing to do it ourselves, it speaks volumes. We can tell our kids to do something. We can tell our students to do something, but like I said, if we're not willing to do it, they're not really going to pay it any attention. Because if mommy or daddy is not willing to go and do this, then why do I have to do it too? Or why do I have to do it in the first place? If we try to tell our kids to go to church and yet we're not willing to do it, or if we have to tell our kids they need to read their Bible and yet they never see us do it, or we tell our kids they need to pray and yet we never do it, it's not going to be important to them. It's not going to have any kind of weight to them. It's just going to be something you do as, instead of something that we are, something that is part of us. <coughs> it's time that we as parents as leaders, begin to live the life that we desire for our students to live. If we want our students to be sold out to Jesus, we need to be sold out to Jesus. If we want our students to be faithful to church, we need to be faithful to church. If we want our students to be men and women of integrity, trusting in Christ over the world, loving, faithful, godly individuals, we need to be those things too. I want to challenge you to be one more thing, and that's to be their spiritual hero. Whenever our kids are young, and mine are still young, and they ask them in school, you know, who is your hero? Some of them say Spider-Man, some of them say Batman. Jonah said my dad. And that really kind of got me. Because, I mean, he sees me at my worst, and I'm still his hero. He sees me when I get frustrated, when I react the wrong way to certain things, and yet he still looks up to me as his hero. How many of us should have the desire that when our kids look to us in our spiritual life, in our physical life, whatever it may be, that we are their heroes. 
that causes us to constantly keep ourselves in check, to constantly evaluate our heart to see if we're lining up to where God is wanting us to be. The definition of a hero is a person who is idealized for courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. How would you feel if you knew that you were your child's spiritual hero, that you were the person they looked up to when they were living out their faith? That could be good or bad. When our kids look to us and see our faith, do they think that we're a superhero or we're a super dud? That we're growing spiritually or that there's nothing there? Because they are looking at us, and they're looking at us to see who they should be. They look at us for our identity, so we need to look at Christ for ours. They can look to you and see that no matter how difficult the situation, you put your trust in God and what he wanted rather than looking to the world. So what I'm asking you today to do is to challenge yourselves to be an authentic believer, to ask yourself if the spiritual life that you are leading is one that you would desire for your student to have. Would you be satisfied if your student had the exact same spiritual life that you have right now? Some would say yes, some would say no. Hopefully some of you would have your eyes open. Because whatever spiritual life you have, whenever they become your age, it's very possible they're going to have that exact same spiritual life. And if you're not satisfied in Christ, if you don't feel like God is moving in a way that he should, then there's a reason for that. And your kid's going to be in that same situation. <clears throat> have you learned authenticity? Are you living authentically? And are you leading authentically? If everyone would bow their heads and close their eyes. <clears throat> For the invitation today, I want to do two things. If you feel that the Holy Spirit is working in your heart and you have yet to know Christ as your Savior, please come and speak to me or speak to Brother Van, and we can help you to learn to know who Christ is so that you can begin that journey. If you know Christ and are a parent, I want to invite you to find your student around the sanctuary. And you can either come to the altar or stay with them in the pew and just pray with them for yourself to lead by example, to encourage them and to love them as Christ would, and that they would learn from your walk how to be an authentic Christian. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for who you are and how you set the example of authenticity. I pray that you would work in every one of our hearts, Lord, that you would begin to, to continue molding us into exactly who it is you want us to be. Lord, as fathers, I pray that you would challenge us and convict us to, to step up our game, to lead the example in our families, for our wives, for our children, that they could see that our faith is authentic. Lord, they could see that you have called us to be a father. You've called us to lead them and then they could grow spiritually because of how they see what we're doing. I pray for mothers, Lord, that you would encourage them and that you would challenge them as well to lead their daughters. Lord, and challenge this entire family that we would be faithful to church, Lord, we would be faithful to reading your word as a family, that we would find mentors that could help our students to grow closer to you. And I pray, Lord, that we could ultimately live authentically as you have called us to live. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
parents, we also need your child here tonight. If they have a part in the drama of our children's Christmas program, please have them here at 6 o'clock. Thank you. 